uh, you know, 20 groups, and you know, that was uh, two. There was, there was 40 different groups of 500, and he doesn't remember what it was. Okay, could the rabbis modify that data now? Yes, they could, because even though that data was here, it's not here anymore. It's back in the future, right? It's back in the future because now it wouldn't violate any rules, however that data came out, because we don't know how it's going to come out anymore. So you see, things can come and things can go. What matters is just those two rules, historical consistency and abiding by the rule set. This is a probabilistic reality that you live in. How does Bill Tiller make the pH go up in his water with intent? Well, how does he do that? When you look at the pH of water, it's not a straight line at 7. pH of water, if you look at it down at the microscopic level, where you can see variations to 20 decimal places, the pH is doing this, you know, with time, all the time. It's jumping around. There's little, <laughs> there's little H pluses and, and OH minuses that are combining and recombining, and all that stuff is going on. It's a dynamic situation. Well, there's uncertainty in there. And where there's uncertainty, you can modify the future. So with an applied intent, you can say that in that uncertainty band of pH, even down at the 0.01 level or wherever that uncertainty is, it doesn't matter, you can modify so that when it makes the choice, so when you, when it make, when you make the measurement and you stick that meter in, you can bias it up a little bit within the uncertainty, not beyond the uncertainty. You can at one leap, you know. You couldn't, those people couldn't have made every patient on their 500, you know, um, get out of the hospital, you know, in an hour. They couldn't do that. They can only move it within the uncertainty that's there. Okay, so you can move that pH up within the uncertainty of where it might be at any instant, and then you move it up a little more from that one, move it up a little more, and just like you walk that robot off the table, you can walk that pH up in level, or you can walk it down. The mind does these things. So that's how that experiment works. Now the little robot, what you're doing there is when, when it's going to pick a random number from our viewpoint, we don't know what that random number is. It could be anywhere from here to here. Well, that's an unknown. Because it's unknown, we can bias it. We can make it pick it a little to the high side, a little to the low side. And enough, a little to the high side's all in a row, the robot walks off the table and falls. Okay? So that's how all those experiments work. All right, now, um, we're going to talk about virtual reality in a minute. Those green boxes are uh, little volumes of uh, volume. Okay, this is a virtual reality. To make any virtual reality, the main thing you have to understand is how much computing resources you're going to need for that virtual reality. So if you were going to build a World of Warcraft, that'd be your first calculation. How much resources do you need? Well, that's specced by two things. One, by how big's a pixel? Okay, so if we look at your computer screen, a pixel is just a little box that has a value that tells the color and the intensity. Okay, now if you have a whole lot of pixels, if very dense, high density of pixels, you get very high resolution. But it's also every pixel is data that you have to provide. So the more pixels, the more data it takes. Okay, now your second thing is frame rate. How often do you have to update those pixels? You got a lot of pixels, you have to update them for a whole lot. Then it takes a lot of throughput and a lot of data. That's how you spec a virtual reality. All right, our virtual reality is spec the same way. Okay, here, here are these uh, pixels. These, these pixels of uh, volume, because we're in a three-dimensional game, not a two-dimensional game. Okay, a 3D pixel is one quantum of volume. The frame rate, that's that delta T. You know, the simulation, the outer loop, time goes around delta T. That's a quantum of time for the simulation. All right, now, the quantum of volume, they have to be constant. And the reason they have to be constant is the same reason why the pixels on your screen have to be all the same size. Let's say you had a computer screen and you had a whole bunch of little tiny pixels down here and then in the middle you had pixels that were like a square inch a piece and then over here you had some that were in between and are all over. Well, what would the something moving across your screen look like? It would look like you were looking at a funhouse mirror, right? It would be terribly distorted. It would come and go and, and uh, it, it wouldn't be a smooth kind of motion anymore. Well, that's the same thing. If you change the, those, if those pixels of volume weren't constant, a uh, ruler over here would be, a, you know, let's say it would be one foot, but you move it over here, it may be bigger because the pixels aren't all the same size. So you have to have constant there. It's the same with the time. If the delta T wasn't constant, then it'd be the same way as if your computer screen wasn't updated at a constant rate of, you know, 240 or 60 hertz. Y your motion would be jerky. Suddenly you go fast, you know, it'd be like uh, jumping back and forth between slow motion and fast motion. Stuff would be jittery and jumping all over. Well, you can't have that. So if these two things are constant, and they have to be in order to produce this homogeneous isotropic 
reality, which we need to be functional. Right? That's required. Otherwise, we don't have we have a funhouse reality, and you don't have feedback. It's not a good schoolroom where your children can't depend on what's going to happen next. You know, sometimes the teachers there, sometimes they're not. You know, their books come and go. You know, you can't have that kind of schoolroom. It has to be buttoned down and consistent. So you need this homogeneous isotropic uh, reality to be functional. That's a constant. That's a constant. Then C is a constant. And this cube root of delta V is just a distance, right? That's a volume. You take cube root of it, you get a distance. Well, what does this mean? What this means, that C is the speed of light. So these cells, something that, that moves through this reality has to go from this cell to this cell to this cell to this cell because otherwise it would be teleporting, right? If it didn't move through contiguous cells, it would be here and the next minute it would be someplace else. That doesn't fly in our nice reality. That wouldn't make a good schoolhouse either with things coming and going and disappearing all the time. So because we need this homogeneous isotropic reality, that D, V must be a constant, delta T must be a constant, and C is a constant, and that constant C is how fast things can move through this reality frame. Delta T, the very next delta T, as far as it can go, is the next cell. Next delta T, as far as it can go, is the next cell, and so on. So that puts the upper limit of the speed of light as a constant. And that's because, one, we need this isotropic reality. Our calculus wouldn't work. None of our rule sets would work if we had a funhouse reality. And what that tells you is that uh, relativity theory is a logical consequence of C being constant. C being constant is a logical consequence of reality being digital and virtual. Uh, the magnitude of C represents a constant that specifies the demands placed upon the virtual reality rendering engine. Okay, it's just that's what specs how much crunch power you need to produce, to produce this reality frame. And uh, that's constant. All right. Summary and results. Let's just run through a couple of uh, quick uh, results here. Okay. Uh, here's some deep sighs. So I'm getting close to the end, guys. Hang on. Just a, just a little bit, a little bit more. I don't see a hook, so we're all right for, for a few more minutes. Okay. Um, Summary, modeling consciousness as a self-modifying digital information system that evolves towards states of lower entropy. That's our model. Okay, physical reality is a virtual reality, a subset of the larger consciousness system designed to help budding individual, individuated units of consciousness, that's you, evolve by lowering their entropy through experience and interaction. Results, okay, results are that physics and metaphysics become parts of one logical theory and are thus unified. Love and spirituality are both defined in terms of entropy. Normal and paranormal are unified as just one thing. It's all normal. It's just the way our reality works. Uh, we have um, derived a fundamental purpose of existence in general and of our existence in particular, and that is to, avoid, to evolve toward lower entropy states. The result is that time Relativity and quantum mechanics have been derived from one overarching fundamental theory with just two assumptions. There's only two assumptions in this model, and that's that, that consciousness exists and that evolution exists. The measurement problem's been solved, the invariant velocity of light problem's been solved, and we have solved Einstein's little toe. Okay, we can now explain both of those. Um, a lot of other things have been solved, too. We'll get to some of those later. Additional results, lowering entropy increases the energy, power, information available to an evolving entity. Okay, think of some people that you know of who have evolved toward being love. In other words, they're more evolved. Who might come to your mind? Mahatma Gandhi? Hmm, Buddha? Uh, Martin Luther King? Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa? Right. These are all people who have evolved to and Now make a list of the people who really are powerful, who have made humongous effects on their cultures, on their societies on other people. It's the same list of people, isn't it? You see, lowering your entropy gives you more power. Remember that bottle of gasoline? We showed that. You lower your entropy, your power increases. Okay, love is defined as the fundamental expression of low entropy consciousness. The larger consciousness system is a aware evolving system. It's real, therefore finite. We are individuated units of consciousness, chips off the old block, one with all that is. We're all netted. Every consciousness, we're all part of this whole thing, right? And we're all netted. And we're not a little individuated part sitting off by ourselves. We're just a part of the whole consciousness system. You know, a good example of that is you have a Word document. Where do you think your Word document is on your hard drive? You think it's a little bundle of one and zeros, some corner of your hard drive? No, it's spread all over. Well, that's the way we are. We're spread all over. We're just part of the larger system. 
Ähm.